Hi, this is Dale Christie. I'm business fellow and blockchain strategist for FedEx. It's my honor to join you today. And I look forward to your questions and answers after this. Um, let's go back um, a number of years now to start. This is a, su a subject, blockchain is not a very intuitive subject. So let me go back and kind of paint a history uh, lesson for you. And then we've got a number of things we wanna talk about. So uh, on Halloween of 2008, a paper showed up online that talked about what ultimately was referred to as Bitcoin. And it talked about um, a, uh, not, no longer needing a trusted third party for financial transactions. And uh, it caught everybody off guard. And it has dominated the discussion since late 2008. But I also wanna go back and kind of paint that picture for you because I know this is a student group. And so in 2008, essentially, there was not a lot of confidence in the financial community. Uh, again, I'm in the US, but uh, in the US and I think around the world, there was a lot of uh, doubt about that. We had just come out of a recession, uh, kind of in the deeper part of the recession. Uh, there were a lot of uh, financial institution issues, mortgage issues, and uh, it really kind of shook the confidence from a financial community uh, of, of the average person. And so this paper comes out and starts talking about not needing a trusted third party um, and talking about digital currency. Um, it took a while for people to kind of understand that. And so for most of the time since then, uh, that really developed um, uh, digital currency using cryptography. So that gets you to a slang of cryptocurrency. Um, but we need to drill down a little bit because from a FedEx point of view, we don't care much about the currency side of things. Certainly we are aware of it and we're following it, but it's really a, a different discussion that we wanna have. So when we, get, when we got the internet 20 or 25 or so years ago, none of us really knew what to do with it. They kept talking about the internet, they kept talking about it, they kept making the references, but nobody really knew what to do with it because there were really no apps for it at that point in time. So internet as the foundational protocol um, is important to understand. And then from that, we got things like email or web browsers or lots of things that sat on that internet. When we got to Bitcoin, I think most people didn't really know how to describe it or to understand it. And so as it turns out, Bitcoin is actually not the protocol. Blockchain is the protocol and Bitcoin sits on top of that. And so if I use that reference as a car, as a, as a, as a shiny new car vehicle, um, Bitcoin is the car, is the vehicle, blockchain is the engine, the internal combustion engine or electric motor inside that vehicle. So one drives the other. If you take that engine or motor out of that vehicle, what could you do with it? You could create a generator or a power washer or a lawnmower or lots of things from that point of view. But that's what you should think of blockchain. Blockchain is the engine behind these cryptocurrencies. And from a FedEx point of view, we wanna pull that engine out and look at that and say, what else can it do for us? And so again, with Bitcoin, we got, a, we got an app that we didn't know what to do with. Um, now we've separated that. And now let's talk about uh, blockchain as that engine. Um, and let's go back to that original Bitcoin paper um, and not needing a trusted third party. Um, at the time, as I said, people had very little confidence in the financial industry with mortgage defaults and all kinds of things. And so I would challenge you. So what does not needing a trusted third party look like? Well, what that actually looks like, it gets us to one of the very key things about blockchain, which is the reference to peer-to-peer -peer technology. And so if Beth needs a ride and I have a car, then a ride sharing app may be a better solution than the original taxi model. However, it's still a business model. And so that business model is still going to carve some slice right off the top from a profit point of view. However, now using a trusted, uh, a peer to peer technology, if you need a ride and I have a car and we can find each other in a trusted environment like blockchain, we may no longer need that middleman. And so that gets you to the concept of essentially um, somebody sitting between supply and demand. And that doesn't have to be in the business or enterprise world. It could be in the not-for-profit world as well. But somebody sitting between supply and demand uh, and essentially playing matchmaker, bringing the two of us together. So uh, again, let's drill down on that a little bit because what we've happened onto is something that is really critical 
that scales in global supply chain, which again is the concept of supply and demand. So supply, I have a car, demand, you need a ride. Supply and demand drives global commerce. And again, it can be in the for-profit or not-for-profit world. But we now just started with this nine page obscure paper in 2008 that appears out of nowhere online. And right now, all of a sudden, we're ready to change the world. My team did the first blockchain use case at FedEx several years ago. We were trying to solve a dispute resolution scenario involving three parties, a receiver, a shipper, and a carrier. Uh, the three of us kind of got sideways from a communications point of view because we were speaking different data languages and that's really all we're talking about here. Blockchain is just data. It's just secure, authentic data that creates a trusted data layer. It's not magic dust. We can't sprinkle it on something and have it grow six feet tall. It's just data. And so in that case, the shipper and the receiver were speaking a purchase order language, and we as the carrier were speaking a bill of lading language. And while it just sounds like a paperwork or kind of a minor difference from that point of view, it was a couple of million dollars US annually for us, and it was about 25 million annually for the shipper. So that starts to get big pretty quickly. And what I learned from that is that blockchain can create a secure and authentic chain of custody and a common data language for all parties. And that is certainly transferable well beyond our scenario. But the aha moment for me from a FedEx point of view during that first use case was some example like Shanghai to San Jose or London to Memphis where we're crossing a border. Because, you know, that's a real example because we go to 220 countries and territories. There's a broker, there's a forwarder, there's a brother-in-law, I know some lady, and all these people have to hand off something to the next person literally across the world. That connects us back to this peer-to-peer -peer technology comment I made a moment ago. So back to, uh, you know, somebody needing a ride demand and me having a car supply if shanghai and san jose or london to memphis can find each other in a trusted environment there are a lot of middleman roles that may be disrupted in the global commerce space again certainly this applies to fedex in a commerce space but it also the identical logic applies to not-for-profits or government agencies or non-government agencies as well um, processes are processes, whether dollars are involved or not. So many, many businesses play a middleman role. That could be a ride sharing app, that could be um, a, 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 a marketplace, an online marketplace, uh, it could be all kinds of things. But again, if you and I can find each other and do so in a trusted environment, it really changes a lot of those processes and it changes a lot of the world of business. So many companies connect, uh, simply connect supply and demand through an app or a website. Um, blockchain won't make that middle role become extinct, but if that is your business model, you need to understand, I believe sooner rather than later, that either uh, that kind of model could be, dis you, you could either disrupt or be disrupted with that model with peer-to-peer -peer technology. By the way, as I said, the middleman role doesn't have to be in a for-profit scenario. It, it could apply to the United Nations or a refugee situation or other similar scenario. Supply chains are very complex and they tend to be very cumbersome. Peer-to-peer -peer technology will completely change the way we consider how they can be improved. Let's get to one of the other key points about blockchain. It's just data. I mentioned that a minute ago. It's not magic dust. You can't sprinkle it on something, et cetera, et cetera. It is crypt cryptographically secure data that creates a secure chain of custody. And that gets us to the word provenance or authenticity or pedigree. Do you really know where that romaine lettuce came from? Or how sure are you that that Rolex watch or that Gucci bag or other example is authentic? Blockchain can solve that. One of my conference slides has a picture of a mango, has three things on the slide, a picture of a mango, uh, a picture of a bottle of extra virgin olive oil and an RFID tag. And the question at the top of the slide says, which of these could you put on a blockchain? It's a bit of a trick question because the answer is actually all three, but it leads us to the next key point of understanding from a blockchain point of view. When I think of art versus science, the question is how can you translate art to science? I think blockchain can actually also solve that one. It gets us to the notion of subjective trust 
versus objective trust. Subjective trust, which is a bit of a leap of faith, which is he or she says they are someone or they represent someone or they tell me that the product or whatever the case may be. Objective trust means I don't have to trust, I don't have to kind of have that leap of faith that that's actually true. We actually have data on it and we can connect it back to there. If you start with a mango or any of these other examples, olive oil, et cetera, you could create a unique digital fingerprint. And that's one of the key points here of blockchain. If you could create that unique digital fingerprint, you could put that digital fingerprint essentially on a blockchain. All of the data about that fingerprint is now secure and it's all connected throughout the life of the product upstream to downstream. Some people will refer to that as a digital twin and it also will change global commerce. We have a quote from our chairman um, that I'm gonna show you uh, in, a, in a moment when I wrap up, I've got a few slides, but this quote from our chairman goes back to 1978. And that quote is the information about the package is as important as the package itself, which again was about 40 years ahead of its time. And it's more relevant and true today than it was in 1978. Today, if you think of a physical package on one side and the digital twin of that package on the other side, they are two completely separate processes. Data today gets us our music, it gets us our media, it gets us all kinds of things. And so we don't think twice about that from a music point of view, oh, it's just data. Or if I put a song in, it will tell me other songs that I might like, but that's really what we're talking about in, in our global logistics company as well. If I have that data about that package, the data about the data becomes very important. And there are all kinds of things that we can do with that, but we're gonna to have to make sense of that data. Um, data by itself isn't that interesting, but again, if we can change it to knowledge and intelligence, we can then get to analytics and optimization. And then that takes us to predictive and prescriptive models. And that all started from simply some type of data that now using blockchain, we can securely and authentically connect and we can do all kinds of things with it. The ability to have a single source of truth and to be able to prove that that item is an original will completely change how we think of these things. Whether that is the food product that we buy at the store or some product that we buy online, or if maybe we have a small business and we are trying to prove somewhere else in the world that you're trying to sell to that that's an original, blockchain is going to help us be able to do those kinds of things. And that will fight things like counterfeit. It will help us prove that that company is sustainable and ethical. All types of things that become increasingly important moving forward, we think blockchain will help with that. That also gets us to authenticity around everything that takes us to things like medical records and uh, e-voting and passports and all kinds of things as we move forward. Another of the killer apps associated with blockchain is called smart contracts. Um, and here's an example of a FedEx piece of that as to how smart contracts might work. Um, think of contract, smart contracts as a series of if, comma, then statements, kind of like a big fancy uh, Excel spreadsheet macro kind of a thing. If I deliver your product, so I'm starting with if, if I deliver your product on time, and if I keep it within the temperature and the humidity range that you requested, then you will pay me for it. It doesn't sound like a big deal uh, saying in that way because it happens all the time. But all of that's going to be managed with sensors and code and, and these smart contracts are basically code on the cloud. And it will also finish with a micro payment. But to put a finer point on it right now, the world deals with payment terms in the days or weeks or months. A might, so rather than a net 10 days or 30 days or 60 days, a micropayment is essentially net zero days. It is instant. If I think of who my customer is, I might think of Beth, who is an e-commerce customer, and she's also a human, which sounds obvious. However, increasingly, Beth will also be what I will refer to as a machine, which is how I will describe a smart contract. So the important piece here is that Beth, the human, might have five or 10 smart contracts working for her in, not, in not, the not too distant future, and those machines are actually the biggest consumer group moving forward. And so for every human Beth, there will be a thousand or so machines, those smart contracts, 
Um, and that will happen in the next five years. That's just around the corner. So with the discussion around smart contracts, we now just change this from a technology discussion to a C-suite and a strategic discussion. You just got the chief financial officer's attention by getting their money more quickly, almost instantly. The chief information officer is now gonna need people to code those smart contracts. The chief legal officer is gonna need essentially bilingual attorneys and lawyers who, can, who are fluent in both paper contracts as well as smart contracts. And now we're halfway around the, 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 the C-suite, the chief suite, right? Um, also smart, as I said, the smart contracts are gonna be the next massive consumer group and they will be making purchasing decisions and they will have a wallet. That fundamentally changes what companies like FedEx and all others consider of who is my customer. Well, my customer could be human or increasingly moving forward, it could be one of these smart contracts. How do I uh, manage them? How do I support them? How do I even know that they exist, et cetera, et cetera. And so um, at this point, um, let's take a breath and I'm gonna need to take you up into the blimp we're gonna go way, way, way up high, back up into that um, international space station level view, basically. Um, and we're gonna turn you into a blockchain strategist. I've spent many years doing quality and process improvement and strategy. And most of the time, the concept of process improvement means you crank down the microscope. You keep taking it down closer and closer to see what the underlying issues are. However, I don't think of blockchain as process improvement. I actually think of it as breakthrough thinking. In some cases, to better understand something, you actually need to pull back from it. So, because we go to 220 countries and territories, I never take for granted the luxury I have of, of having a default position, essentially from the International Space Station. And when I look at blockchain and other things from that view, there is no FedEx, there is no industry, and there are no borders. So let's spend the next few minutes with that in mind. Many people have been trying to treat the blockchain, uh, treat blockchain technology like the internet. Let's get a few smart people together. Let's get some money to build a product. Let's get some customers, uh, et cetera. Let's, let's make a profit, right, from that point of view. Um, that leads us to the consortia or consortium approach. Um, three of us all sign non-disclosure agreements, uh, and then we add somebody, and then we add somebody else, and we add somebody else. The problem is from our International Space Station view, that concept won't scale. We might be able to get to 50 or 100 or even 1,000 people in our consortium, but there are tens of thousands of companies, hundreds of thousands maybe, in global commerce, all the way to a bicycle delivery company. So here's our fork in the road. Consortia on one side and open, open source, open products, open, open design on the other. From a FedEx point of view, we believe that open is inevitable. While some consortia examples may work in blockchain, we believe signing non-disclosure simply won't scale on a global commerce basis. By comparison, we believe if you hang an open source license like Apache or MIT or et cetera on the door, and if you're okay with using that open source license, then come on in. We believe the open model can scale globally in the global commerce space. And that has led us to brand new insights for an almost 50 year old global brand that open is inevitable. The typical example of putting smart, super smart people in the same room and basically you know, sliding food under the door until they finish, and then you put your brand on it and put that out to the market, we don't think works in this case. We believe for blockchain to be transformative, it has to be bigger than us. In other words, one of our major competitors wouldn't pay us to use our blockchain solution and vice versa. So that leads us to our thought leadership position from the International Space Station, where it will take coopetition to build out the non-competitive open source platform on which blockchain will be based. The critical concept here is it's not about where we compete, it's about where we can agree. And we've seen that happen from a pandemic point of view when it talks about uh, personal protective equipment, medical supplies, and other types of things where people put, put maybe their profit interest or other interests aside for a greater good. We've now seen that happen from that point of view. Um, we're on the same um, Blockchain and Transport Alliance Standards Council with UPS, with Salesforce, with J.B. Hunt, and many others. Some of those would be considered competitors. But we're all focused on the creation of royalty-free, open-source data standards in the global commerce space, and we commonly sit at the same table and work through this. The problem is, coopetition isn't taught on your first, isn't taught at business school, it's not taught on your first day of uh, employee orientation. 
uh, or likely in master's programs or anything else. Um, we are still taught that your competitor is your competitor, period. However, FedEx is part of a trade association that only has three members, FedEx, UPS, and DHL, uh, called the Global Express Association. And last year, the three of us worked together side by side to create a position paper on blockchain and emerging technologies, which was submitted to the World Customs Organization. So where can those three companies agree? We can agree that where we can reduce friction across borders, that's paperwork and delays and resources, uh, we win, our customers win, and global trade wins. We think it's gonna take a global village to build out this non-competitive open source platform and then all kinds of proprietary and other solutions can be built on top of it. So with that, I'm gonna transition over to a few slides before I wrap up. And um, let, me, let me get to those real quickly as I kind of talk my way through that. And so here uh, is just a picture I pulled up of um, people putting sandbags down um, for flood. They're trying to keep the water from coming from one side to the other. But I want you to think of this visual essentially as almost any process. That could be global supply chain, that could be a process within the United Nations or, or, or refugee efforts or, or anything else. Most processes, whether you realize it or not, are a series of steps and many of them are not very efficient. They are cumbersome and they are complex. Certainly, if I use the Shanghai to San Jose or the London to Memphis example within our logistics world, uh, it takes a broker, a forwarder, it takes a lot of people to get it from point A to point B. So think of this and think of blockchain and our peer-to-peer -peer technology discussion as a completely different way to do that. So while I'm speaking about the, the global logistics side of things, I wanna to speak to you as a student, uh, as, as a young person, as a person coming into an area, you may not even know yet uh, where you want to put your passion and your effort. Um, and that's okay, but if you do know where these nuggets of technology will help you change those for the better. You'll be able to help reduce the handoffs from that point of view, um, and uh, that will improve processes and you can make a huge impact from that point of view. So let me give two or three more quick examples here. These are a couple of quotes from our, from our executive suite. Again, we believe it's the next frontier that's gonna completely change worldwide supply chains. Uh, and as I said, we believe that in order for blockchain to be transformative, it has to be much bigger than us. Um, here's the quote that I referred to from our chairman and here's a visual of that. So you have a physical network that's on the left and he was referring to that. You also have a digital network on the right, and that digital twin is gonna be transformative moving forward. And then finally, I will just tell you that we think blockchain is gonna be a big thing. Uh, it's gonna be, uh, again, we think it's gonna completely change worldwide supply chains. We think standardization is critical, no different than railroads or telegraphs or the electrical grid or the alphabet. Once we can standardize these things, all, all can participate. We think that not only is Beth a human, but Beth's also a machine, those smart contracts, and there's gonna be a thousand of them for every one human Beth within a few years. Once again, data is, is interesting, but it's really interesting when we change it to knowledge and intelligence, uh, and then we can do analytics and optimization around it. We think the government should mandate blockchain. We think that we all have to work together to build it, and that leads us to a coopetition, where we all have to figure out a way to work together. It's not about where we compete, it's about where we can agree. And so with that, I will stop and I very much look forward to your questions and answers.